Here we go. Are you ready? I haven't put the fig on my my laptop yet. It still has Apple, but. <laughs> Um, I wanted to mention something that Jesus, Jesus had, had talked to me about, and that was that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, you know how he said that in the garden. And what happened was a lot of the disciples, um, you know, most of them, I, I think that John was probably the most stable one, you know, of all of them. So you have Peter, James, and John, and then John was... He might have been the youngest, but he was, he was, he was real confident because he even said, you know, referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. You know, he was his favorite, and uh, in his own writings, and it's kind of like Moses. You know, he's, yeah, he's the most humble man. But but the, really, when you look at what that meant, that word there is bu uh, buffeted, the most, you know, buffeted man, <laughs> the me most meekest man. The, you know, so there was this this idea that Moses was probably buffeted more than anyone else. So he wasn't really bragging because, you know, you've heard about the man who that was, he was the humblest man in the church. And so they gave him an award, they gave him a pin and uh, he wore it the next week to church and they had to take it away from him. So, <laughs> but he was voted the most humble man, but, but see, he wrote that Moses wrote Genesis from the mountain. It was dictated to him. But I want to talk to you just a little bit uh, for personal application and, and to, to ask yourself this. If you really want uh, the, the, the real thing, which is what I wanted. When I, when I uh, gave my life to the Lord, I gave my life to the Lord because I said, if you will deal with me like you dealt with the people in the Bible, I will give up the Air Force Academy. I will give up everything that I want to do. And he, the Spirit of God came in to my life, and I was born again. And then all of a sudden, things started happening to me supernaturally. And I had to make a choice uh, constantly. Am I going to yield to the flesh, or am I going to yield to the Spirit? And I wasn't told, you know, when I became a Christian, I wasn't told the two things that you should know. One of them is your life is not your own anymore. And no one tells you that, but you, you, you just bought, you're bought out. Okay, number two is your congratulations, you're in a war. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they didn't tell me these things. So there's a war that you enter into because every evil spirit is notified. And, and it's not like what you think. You get lit up on the map and your, your spirit is, is on fire. It's bright and it, show, it shines. Like right now as I'm speaking to you, the spiritual gift that's in me is lit up. So it's igniting this whole area. So in the spirit realm, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things happening right now that would look like a movie. And then if one of you would come up here and prophesy or have a word of knowledge, word of wisdom, if you would speak in tongues and someone would interpret, you would see this whole place just lighting up even brighter than it already is. And, and it would be these shock waves going through the atmosphere in the spirit, though, it'd be not this physical realm. And it would be hitting these, these entities, and they'd be getting knocked back and falling, and they'd be screaming and running. And then, you know, tomorrow morning, they're going to try to steal every word that was sown into you and try to diminish. They're going to discredit me. They're going to discredit you. They're going to discredit the word. They're going to work to try to take it back somehow. And if left unattended, they will come closer and closer and closer. And then this will just, this church could turn in just a little club where, where you, where you talk about the reader's digest and you know, the, whatever article or talk about politics, but see the house of God is a house of prayer. Okay. All right. It's the same way with your house. Your temple is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So Satan is going to try to come in and try to compromise that. 
So the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? Okay, so Paul said, I glory in my weaknesses because then the power of God is revealed. So weakness was his friend is what I always say. And so we, we, I ride on a wave of weakness where I can barely tolerate anything anymore. I don't want to even be here. You have to be like an alien in this world. You're a stranger. In Hebrew, it's stranger. You're just passing through. You have to have that mentality because you cannot fit in. You cannot love the world and God. You cannot fit in down here. You can't serve both God and money. You can't, you can't love money and love God. Okay, because the way the system's set up, you either serve money or you serve God. Well, you, you serve yourself or you serve others. There's all these choices you make, but the supernatural is, is yours every day. But what is the supernatural? Well, it's God's natural. It's what God lives in every day. But see, God is a spirit. So those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So if your six-string guitar turns into a five-string while you're playing it, you just keep playing. Right? If they all break, you tap your foot. But whatever you do, you do it. You do it in the spirit. So there is praying in the spirit. There's praying in, in the understanding. You know, there's singing in the spirit, singing in the understanding. There's all these different things. So... I don't really differentiate between this realm and that realm, you know, all that. The reason why is I am a spiritual being that has a body. I have a spirit. My spirit rejoices. My spirit knows things that my head doesn't know. And over the years, I mean, this is my 40th year of walking with God. Now, I've been called for 50 years. I was called at 10, but I got saved at 19. So I'm in my 40th year right now of walking with God. I think I know something about walking with God. And if you are a Christian for that long, then you should know something about walking with God. However, the biggest thing I've learned is that the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And if you want to walk in the supernatural, it's really more natural than you think. It's your body and your mind that do not want you to do that because they don't participate in it. Right? So when you go to pray, your body's going to want the chicken in the refrigerator. And your mind is going to think of all the things you forgot to do. But you couldn't remember them when you were trying to make a list. It's the truth, okay? What's happened is the mind tries to find things. It's like a little child that waits till you go to the grocery store to, to throw a fit, to use the crowds as a leverage. They're playing the crowds. They know exactly what they're doing. So the, the so you didn't want them to have Captain Crunch? Well, just they're, they're going to make it so bad that they you give them three boxes of Captain Crunch and get them out to the car as fast as possible. Okay, they're, they're leveraged. Now, kids don't listen to me when I'm telling you this. <laughs> but the mind will try to leverage in order to, get, to participate in that. But Paul said that when you pray in an unknown tongue, your mind does not participate. It's not fruitful. Okay, so you're exercising your spirit. Okay, so the weakness of the flesh is part of living down here. See, the, what the law couldn't do God did through Jesus Christ, right? Through the Spirit. Okay, so you have Romans chapter 7, which talks about all the things that Paul wants to do that he can't do. The things he doesn't want to do, he does. Wretched man that I am. But keep reading. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, right? Then you click over. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And then he goes into this amazing thing. He says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. But he says, don't give any provision to the flesh. So I don't sin so that grace abounds. 
In other words, you've opted out of the supernatural because you're, you know what? You, you can go and sin and repent and go to heaven. You can, you can keep repenting. God's going to keep taking you back. No problem with that. But your relationship, your communion with him, your fellowship with him is damaged when you sin. When you choose to yield to the flesh, all you're doing is you're opting out of the intimacy. But there's eventually a time where your, the sin is going to drag you away. It's going to be your master. So you don't want to give, you don't want to feed the flesh. You, you want to eat your double, double uh, burger with cheese, but you don't want to feed it with carnal things. In other words, you don't want to give it its way all the time. You want to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live an upright life in Christ Jesus. If it sounds familiar, because it's a scripture. So Paul was, was really a master because he had been caught up and he understood the law understood the old covenant, but he was caught up. And then he saw, listen, this is how you do it. You have to walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Okay. So you're constantly as a Christian, I wasn't told this. So in my heart, I wanted to do good, but I couldn't do it. And so I thought something magical would happen to me as far as managing my flesh and my mind as a Christian when I became a Christian, but see, it doesn't automatically happen. Your spirit gets saved. That's the, that's the part of you that lives forever. That's what was breathed into your mother's womb. Your body was formed according to Psalms 139 with that. And then you became a living soul. You were born. But Jesus said there was a born again experience. And Nicodemus said, I can't go back into my mother's womb. He goes, oh, no, it's like the trees. You see the results of the spirit, the results of the wind. But you can't see the wind, but you see the trees moving. So you know there's wind. He said it's the same with the spirit. You don't see the spirit, but you see the results of the Holy Spirit moving. Okay, so here is the key to receiving anything from the Lord. We're talking about healing here. But most of the major healings that I've received personally and others that I've seen in our meetings all over the world, they they were, they were the Lord during the meetings, the Lord coming upon a person and them just yielding to whatever it was. They didn't know what it was. And they were instantly healed of incurable things. I mean, things that they had to go back to the doctor and prove that there weren't, there weren't, uh, they weren't wrong anymore. Like there was a lot of back things. Like there were, they would have to have operations. There was uh, heart failure, where they were, they were, they had already quit their job because they were going to die. We've had cancer, tumors, uh, knees, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, a lot of of issues with chemical imbalance, a lot of uh, mental problems. That were just demons, you know. I just went like this, pff, knocked them off. You know, these devils, these liars that just sit on your shoulder. They're just harassing you because you're supposed to do great things for God. They'll come and talk to you because they they're they're very concerned that you might get enough momentum, and they can't stop you. So what happens in the spirit is is that uh, the reason that you get nailed before your breakthrough comes is because you start lighting up in the spirit. You start glowing in the spirit because God's about to do something. And then the angels start coming back and forth. And these demons are standing and watching this. And they watch the trafficking from heaven coming back and forth. And they know that God's up to something with that person. So when you pray and you, and you get lit up and you, you're going to get what you've asked for, they have to do something to get you to opt out because they can't stop it. So they nail you. They'll get you offended. They'll do everything they can. You know, somebody at church will take your parking spot and your chair. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you might you might have a scratch on your door from Eleanor who got out and banged it, you know. Many people go through life wishing they could understand the realm of the spirit and the warfare that goes on behind the scenes. In his brand new study guide and three CD set, The Notes of a Warrior, Volume 1, Dr. Kevin Zadai helps you to develop your ability to engage the enemy on every level. 
Kevin's brand new study guide and three CD set, The Note of a Warrior, Volume 1, will help equip you to learn to recognize God's direction for your life, encounter clarity in knowing God's battle strategies against your enemies, exercise your authority as a believer, walk in increased discernment through the Holy Spirit's power, and much, much more. In this exclusive offer, Kevin also prays impartation prayers on each CD to help you in your advance against the enemy. Order today Kevin's brand new study guide and exclusive three CD set, The Notes of a Warrior, Volume 1, for a donation of $29, US shipping and handling included. To order, call 888-340-1460 with offer code 100T or go online to kevinzadai.com slash offer. It's time to stand up for your rights as a Christian and give the devil a headache. You know, and you just heard the word of God, you felt God, and you see, you have to be continually yield to the Spirit. So, how do you do that? You have to have a mindset so that your mind will side with your spirit. When your spirit is predominant in your life, your mind will have to be submissive and your body will have to be submissive to what God is saying to you in your inner man. So the spirit desires the spiritual things. And the spirit, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, wants to take you into the things of the Spirit. So uh, that's why Paul said that, that no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has for those who love him, but it has been revealed to us by the Spirit. So the mysteries, the deep mysteries of God can be revealed through the Holy Spirit, which is your friend. But he is God and he is holy. So the Spirit of truth is going to walk you into all truth because he's the spirit of truth. That's what he does. That's his thing. But when he comes, he's holy. He knows nothing but the truth. He can't lie. So he's only going to tell you the truth. He's going to lead you into all truth, which means that the written word of God is the truth. And people ask me, well, how do you hear God's voice? I go, I just open my Bible. And I get in tune. See, this is what we do in the, in the aircraft. When I go to the aircraft in the, in the mornings, you have to let it find itself on the earth. It takes 11 minutes. And I can tell it where I'm at right now, but this computer has to find it based on the, the GPS from satellites. So they triangulate. It'll tell you on the computer screen, you are at gate 11 in Grand Rapids, B11. Now, from that point on, once the aircraft knows where it's at, it takes 11 minutes. You can't touch anything. You just turn the power, the battery. You got 20 minutes of power on a battery, but then you hook up the, the ground unit. But you got 20 minutes, so 11 of that is used up to find itself. Once it those lights go out, Navaline lights go out, then you look down and it shows in the world where you're at. Okay, from that point on, whatever you put into that computer, it will take you within three feet autopilot. I mean, you'll have to taxi out. But it will tell you, and it'll tell you if you, it, with this is how much fuel you'll have when you land. This is what time to the second you'll land. And then you have to have 45 minutes of extra fuel on board in case it's bad at the place you're going. You got to have 45 minutes to hold then you have to have enough to go to an alternate. So that's why some of you have gotten pulled off of flights because of bad weather. It's because you just got traded for fuel. Okay, with that being said, with that being said, there's all this preparation that is going on in your life. And it is really synchronized. However, Satan and his evil spirits will make it look random so that you don't feel safe and you don't feel value. But see, your destination is who you are. Where you're going in this life is who you are. 
See, in heaven, you are the currency of heaven. There is no money up there. When you show up, you are the value, the highest valued person or anything in heaven. Did you know that? Besides the son of God, he bought you. You inherited everything he got. Doesn't it say that we are together with him and we're co-heirs with Jesus? Okay, so in heaven, wherever you walk, everything's free because you have laid up in an account what you did down here and your value is in heaven. But the purchase price of Jesus sacrificing his life makes you the most valuable thing in heaven. Now, that is the absolute truth. So when you're on this earth, no one, is this on? No one is going to treat you the way you're supposed to be treated. No one. No one has the capability to discern who you really are, except God himself. So they might read the, the cliff notes or the small paragraph summary of your life, but God knows the whole book. He knows how valuable you are because he, he, he invested in you before you were born by writing about you. And a part of him, when he formed you inside of himself, Jesus let me watch it happen. He thought of me. He formed me inside himself and he breathed me out. I went out as a spirit into my mother's womb. But they weren't planning on having a baby. Well, too bad. They were doing the thing that causes babies to happen. And then they got married. Okay, so I wasn't an accident. My parents were lucky to have me. They were privileged to, my mom was privileged to carry me. But I was from God, just like she was from God. So even though I was an accident and not wanted, I grew up and became a man of God. And not only that, became a voice to this generation. But that is what God had written inside, was, was inside of him that he spoke out after he wrote me in a book. Psalms 139.16. Now, this is not preached at all because it is sometimes you hear it, but I've had to bring it back because Jesus told me that he wrote Psalms 139, even though it was written by a psalmist. The, the Spirit of God, he told me, he said, Kevin, I got pre-existent Jesus. He's always been. He said, I got David by the Spirit of God. I got David to write about me in Psalms 22 and in Psalm 16. And all the prophets, they wrote about me, but they gave key things that were, guys, were points of reference for me. I read through the whole Bible, the whole Torah. And I read through everything. And I found myself. So I... I was growing up as a boy. He said, I was growing up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I grew up in the fear of the Lord. And as I grew up, I, I was discovering because I was, I was part man. I was full man. He was full man and full God. And he said, I discovered who I was and every, I found myself. And there were little, little markers there. And it, in the, the, even the Hebrew scholars don't know, what, if you ask them, they don't really understand why it's there. But there's an Aleph and a Tav uh, for no reason. It doesn't mean anything, but it's, it's, a, it's random places throughout the Hebrew, Hebrew uh, Old Testament. But it's markers that Jesus would look and see himself. He grew up. He, he was at 12 arguing with the, uh, you know, in the temple. And then, you know, Mary lost him for three days. I don't know how you lose God for three days. That's what Jesse says. You know, because Je Jesse, Jesse says, Jesse says, he goes, because he's, we're all, it's all Catholic down where we're at. He goes, you all just, you know, lift Mary up. And she, lo he lost, go she lost God. She lost God for three days. <laughs> and didn't know it. But anyway, um, getting back to this, your, your application is just, you need to meditate on that, that Mark, Mark 9, that ninth chapter, and, and, and think about the fact that Jesus said, listen, I'm willing, will, will you believe to the man? He said, if you're willing, if you're willing, you, you can heal. And he said, I am willing, do you believe? So you need to meditate on that. And then you need to meditate on Acts 10.38, where 
God, uh, through Jesus, was going about doing good and healing everyone that was afflicted or oppressed of the devil. Okay, so we know now the origin of sickness is the devil. We know that he healed everyone. And that in your weakness, you're made strong. Because the power of God is revealed through your weakness, not your strength. So here's the last, so I can finish this session up. Here's the last thing I want to tell you, is that in Romans 8, 26, Paul said, in our weakness, the Spirit comes in as an intercessor, not in our strength. In our weakness, he comes in with deep groanings. And the Aramaic says, super intercedes for us, the perfect will of God. He lifts us up. So I've learned that weakness is my friend. So I let, I let people bash me and, and, you know, I let people just think what they want to think, but I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because I can help people because I know the demonic wants to diminish me. So he wants to diminish you. He just wants to diminish you. He wants you to pull back and, and, and quit because you are effective. You're not defective. You are effective. You're not an accident. You are in the plan and purpose of God. This world's a fallen world. If you're going to judge God by this world, you're, you're going to have a messed up view. If you even judge God by most fathers, you're going to, you're going to be messed up. And, and you religion, for sure, you're going to be messed up. Right? Okay, so in this world, it's all about money. But then they make it about money, and then but then they charge you when you get sick, and they keep you a permanent customer. They give you something that'll mask the the symptoms, but they don't heal you. I mean, they they can, and sometimes it does happen, but every time, every time someone goes in, there's always the risk. There's always a risk because of, of the things that you don't know about mistakes and things like that that happen. And, right. to, you know, they, they say that the most dangerous place to be is the, is the hospital because it's, you, you can get all kinds of like staff and all this stuff. Well, why is that? It's because the devil doesn't want people to be healed. He doesn't want people to live long enough to find out about Jesus. And then he doesn't want Christians to live long enough to do something for God. Yeah. Do you follow me? Okay, so this mode of operation with the enemy is to play against you in your weakness, where God says, no, weakness is your friend. Am I helping or not? Because if I, I can go deeper if you want. Okay, because you, we're taught, like Nike, just do it and be strong, you know. And, you know, like, like uh, the, guy, the, the guy that won the, the Tour de France, Lance, yeah, be be strong. You know, the whole time he's taking steroids. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's but that's the way it is. It, they they project like Hollywood projects a certain thing, and everybody wants to be like them. But then when you find out how they really are, you don't want to be like them. They want to be like you. They just want to go back to playing in a sandbox where it was simple, and drug free. So they're trying to get out of something that you think you want to get into. And, and the thing of it is, is, is Satan, Satan knows what he's doing. He exalts backyard sports. And you get $30 million if you can make a hoop. Or if you can put a football through, through the goalpost. you got to be kidding. A backyard sport and getting $70 million or $300 million or whatever for a backyard sport? No, think about it. Because when I was on the other side, I saw how everything is switched so that people chase after stuff that doesn't even matter. Now, I'm not saying you can't go to a game or do whatever you do. Have your team, rah, rah, rah. That's fine. But then just as act as crazy in church then, too. You know, don't take your shirt off and paint your chest. But I mean, you don't have, you know what I said. But I'm serious. Oh, no, no, no. Think about it. No, think about it. Have you ever thought about this? It's like you, look, you, you, watch, you, watch, in, you, know, you watch the Lions. You watch the Detroit Lions. You watch uh, in Wisconsin, you know, the Cheeseheads. 
and they're crazy, man. You know, they're, they have no shirts on. It's cold. It's like snowing sideways and they're, they don't care. But, but, um, the church is half full on Sunday cause you know, it snowed, but they're out there like in the tailgate party in the snow. It's okay. And so that, that, that's the, that's the only thing that's where it's wrong is where you'll sacrifice for something that doesn't have any internal value. Like a thousand years from now is what's going to matter. What, what you do today, like what you do right now, by being here, you made a decision to be here. Well, I'm going to give you your money's worth, even though you didn't have to pay. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I'm going to make it eternal for you. Okay, so that a thousand years from now, you're going to look back and say, man, I matured in Christ. You know, and you don't have to remember me. I could care less about that because I'm dead. I shouldn't even be alive. And until you die and come back, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But my life is not my own. But the life I live now in the flesh is going to be by faith in the Son of God. I'm going to have him manifest his works through me. You're going to be healed. You're going to be full of the Spirit. You're going to walk in power. Every demon in hell is going to know who you are. That's my goal, is to make hell have a headache. The devil has a headache. Because you woke up this morning. Now, if you want to be successful and make history, you have to listen to what the Spirit is saying to you. What did he tell John throughout Revelation? Hear what the Spirit's saying. That's what Jesus said. Listen to what the Spirit's saying. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, did you know that those churches didn't listen? Do you know that they were all in northern Turkey? They're all gone now. Half of them are mosques. That's bad. Okay, and then the others are gone completely. 